right, before we get to, to the final four and one, do you got our updated records? I do. I actually had to go back and <laughs> I went back and listened. So I'm going to be jotting these down in real time this time. So I don't have to do this. And it was, it was quite a treat to go back and listen to last week's segment, mm. which went long. We'll be, we'll be quicker this time. Uh, and you we'll to see. have this, these, con <laughs> I know you had these picks. You were like, yeah, man, no, it's, I, I got to go with, uh, I got to go with Texas to cover. It was like 11. I got to go with Texas to cover and Florida, Florida state, Florida. And he was like, yeah, how can I not go with the Knowles here? I'm going with the Knowles. Knowles did not cover. So you were one and four. Nah, it doesn't sound right. It, it is. I went back and listened. You were one and four. I feel like I'm getting cheated. I am three and two. Continuing to take, we had a good couple suggestions in the comments last week in this podcast episode on YouTube. Go ahead and drop us some suggestions for what should be on the line for our season long records here. But I'm three and two. You are one and four. You offer up the first four games, and I will do the and one and give us the fifth game to pick. Who do we got? Friday. It's game one. Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern, Ohio at number 13, Kentucky, inside Rex Chapman Arena. Kentucky minus 12. You can watch it on the SEC network. This is tasty. Ohio's good. They lost, they lost an NBA player, and they might be just as good. This is Go ahead. T t talk about their big win. No, I know you want to. Who'd they beat? Why do <laughs> Who'd they beat? We don't, need to, we don't need to talk about that. We just don't need to talk about that. Ohio is uh, 97th, Ken Palm, as we speak right now. 3-0. and um, Yes, they did knock out Belmont. They also have wins over Cleveland State and Bobby Moe. Uh, so here comes a game against Kentucky. Numbers too big. I'm taking... I'm taking Ohio to win this, or not to win, to cover, not to win, not to win, not to win. Mark, I was looking at the name, Mark Sears, sophomore point guard, uh, it will be a wonderful replacement to Jason Preston, who's moved on to uh, to bigger and better things. So you give me 12, and this is the line. This is not the Kempon line. This is the line. We actually have, uh, courtesy of Caesar Sportsbook, uh, for all these Friday games, we have lines. There's a couple Saturday we got to get to, but the Friday games are the actual line lines. So give me Jeff Bowles. And company to win by single or to lose. I keep saying they're going to win like <laughs> to lose by single digits. I hope they win. Go back. Nada will go back, cut this, make it look like I predicted Ohio win the whole time, but I actually think it'll be pretty close. Like they'll lose by five or six Ohio covers with ease. Um, Kentucky's got some wild um, statistical individual yeah. performances going on right now. Dude, I know you're about to say this, but I forgot to mention Oscar Seaboy is averaging 18.7 rebounds a game. What? <laughs> I mean, it's 18.7. Eight, he's averaging 18.3 points and 18.7 rebounds in 30.3 minutes per game. That's outrageous. It's a joke. Um, and then there's Severe Wheeler. Remember, he led the SEC in assists per game last season at Georgia at 7.4. He's averaging 10 assists per game uh, right now in 30 minutes per game, 11 points, 10 assists. And then Kellen Grady is averaging 12 points per game, shooting 56.3% from three. So um, the, the transfer market, I think you could reasonably argue nobody's benefiting from the transfer market right now uh, more than Kentucky. And we talked about this a lot in the preseason, or at least I did, that Kentucky had obvious problems last season. There were, there were three of them that really stood out. Too reliant on freshmen, uh, no no high level point guards, and they could they didn't not enough competent three point shooters. So they go out and add Severe Wheeler, um, Kellen Grady. They enroll Ty Ty Washington. So check out this difference. They added multiple high level point guards and they added shooting. Now check this difference out. Last season, Kentucky shot thirty three point six percent from three, which ranked one hundred and seventy six in the country. And they turned it over on 19.8% of the possessions, which ranked 217th in the country. Now, they're shooting 45.1% from three. That's 18th in the country. And they're only turning it over on 16.6% .6 of their possessions. That ranks 90th in the country. They are like, you know, 150 spots better in the country in three-point field goal uh, percentage. And, you know, like... a, a, a uh, around, you know, two, uh, 120, 130 spots better in offensive turnover rate. They really 
and I, I think this, you know, John really specifically addressed these issues, and it's still early, but the numbers have drastically improved, and that's why Kentucky's going to be a drastically, or at least it's among the reasons Kentucky's going to be a drastically better team than they were last season, and a, you know, legitimate candidate to go to a Final Four, even if they did start the season 0-1 with a loss to Duke. Yeah, I I talked about this on HQ on Friday morning. Uh, then we can move on to the next game. But to me, the perimeter stuff is significant. But the rebounding of Shibwe and what he can be is what will ultimately make Kentucky Final Four worthy, I think, this season. We'll see if he can keep it. 18 a game is not. I mean, that's like that's like Bill Russell territory. Like You cannot. That's not sustainable. But if you're going to tell me Shibwe is going to be like a 14 board a game guy, that's magnificent particularly if he's going to be that good and be reliable on the offensive end so they can get second chance opportunities after threes and all that good stuff uh if you picked it i missed it i have ohio covering who do you have i'll take uh i'll take kentucky to cover just because i'm i'll be different than you that really is the only reason and you say it's not sustainable with she and i think that's probably right like i don't i don't believe he's going to average 18 rebounds per game but this isn't one of those deals where you know, sometimes you see, especially early in the season, like somebody had this massive performance and then, you know, sort of normalized after that. But the average, you know, on the season is still really high. This dude has gone 20, 20 and 16. So it's not like some some outlier performance that's pushing him up to 18 rebounds a game. He's got at least 16 in three consecutive games, one of which was against you know, Duke and that front line that features future NBA players, former five-star prospects. So again, I agree with you. I don't think it's sustainable, but yeah, he's going to, it looks like he's going to average 14, 15, maybe 15 rebounds per game. Um, you know, that he's, he's been incredible uh, so far in the season game two Friday, 9 PM Eastern. It's Georgia tech at Georgia inside Sunday out of Gaines Coliseum, Georgia tech minus five and a half. You can watch it on the sec network. You don't remember Sunday out of games. No, I don't. You got five and a half? That's what it showed me. Take Georgia. I'm going to take Georgia here, uh, but I don't have a great reason. I, I need to know why you picked this game. What what kind it's, of a, it's, it's an in-state rivalry between Josh Pastner and Tom Crean. What are you even talking about? They're playing it in Sunday out of games Coliseum. When I was a young reporter, I had hair and stuff. I uh, covered... Uh, 13 and under AAU national championship tournament. Number one ranked 13 year old in the country at the time. Sunday out of gains. How'd that work out for him? He became a division one player. Yeah. Did some stuff after that. What stuff? Got a Coliseum named after him for one. There we go. I like to see it. I'm going to Uga. Although got to say. Returns aren't that strong. George is two and one. Loss on the road at Cincinnati has beaten FIU and 350th at Ken Palm, South Carolina State by cool 16 points. Georgia Tech is also 2-1, and one, opened up with a home loss for the second consecutive season, by the way, opened up with a home loss to a mid-major team, lost to Miami University. That's out of Ohio, not out of South Beach or Coral Gables, if you will, and uh, has wins over Stetson and Lamar. I don't know what the hell to think about either of these teams. I think Georgia Tech's the better team, but I'll take Georgia to cover in this. Yeah, um, I'll take Georgia plus the points as well. This is year four for Tom Crane. Um, it is not going well. Record to date is 43 and 50 overall, 14 and 40 in the SEC. He's finished 13th, 13th, and tied for 10th in his first three years in the league. And then after last season, like lost his whole team. I think they had six, top six scores, might have transferred. Um, and now, like as you point out, they're outside of the top 160 at Ken Palm well behind Georgia Tech and Georgia State. Um, they're 2-1 and one with a couple of nothing wins to go with that loss at Cincinnati. But Kim Palm currently projects Georgia's record to be 10-20 and 20 overall, 3-15 and 15 in the SEC. That's not a great first four years. He got Marquette going qu more quickly than that, and he got Indiana rebuilt from nothing more quickly than that. I'm surprised that this is going the way it's going. Are you surprised this is going the way it's going? Uh, to this extent, yes. I cannot believe this is season four already, though. It's kind of wild to me that he's already in his fourth year at Georgia. 
And this is undeniably a hot seat situation. If they are not a good team and they are flirting at 500 or worse, it would not surprise me if we wound up seeing a coaching change there. Um, but big opportunity here, like stuff like this. Can you can you win this game? Can you steal this one um, as an underdog? Uh, a nice opportunity. And I do th I do think that Georgia will keep it close. So I will take them to cover. Game three, Saturday. 1 p.m. Eastern, number five, Villanova versus number 17, Tennessee, inside Mohegan Sun Arena. I forgot. Do we name, do we rename neutral court arenas? I don't believe we do. I don't think we do I either. Think, I think we just, uh, we pay respect to the venue that it is. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, but you know what? I saw DMB here less than two weeks ago. This is going to be Carter Beaufort Arena for all I care. Carter Beaufort Arena. I'm going to be on hand. Are you aware of this? Yes, I'm aware. I didn't know if you know. I'm going to this game. We've got a couple actually, of nice ones. We've actually talked about it. Have we? Sure. No. Yeah, Are you going, sure? Yeah, you're going on Saturday, but you can't go on Sunday because it's your boy's birthday. Boom. He's on it. That's right. Not technically his birthday, but we're having the party and all that good stuff. Uh, we can name I, it Staples Center since that's going away. Actually, Let's just, walk. from now on, every neutral court will be Staples Center. So let me do it again. Game three, Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern. It's number five, Villanova versus number seven, ten, 17, Tennessee, inside Staples Center. Kim Palm has it, Villanova minus one. You can watch it on ESPN News. Is that the channel? Dude, you can't it's get on. It's college football Saturday. You're lucky to be on ESPN News. That's wild. Put you, uh, put you. It's either ESPN News or Pac-12 Network. Man, oh man, oh man. Pac-12 Network should try to get that Villanova Tennessee game. It should. That'd, that'd been good for them. Teams in the Pac-12, it'd be one hell of a. Coup. What if the Pac-12 started scheduling non-Pac-12 games? They're like, you know what? We've had enough. I want to know if anyone at the Pac-12 Network listens to this podcast. They must adore you. I just outright adore you. You know what? I I, I can't get the channel. I know it is what it is. I'm not saying you don't walk this back. And I, I, you know what? I reached out to him one time trying to be, uh, cause you Pac-12 fans, West coast fans are always like accusing you of East coast bias. Even though I live in the South, I get constantly accused of East coast bias. And they're like, you don't watch us. You don't watch us. And I'm like, you know what? It's partly true. A, because it's late and I got young kids, but secondly, you know, at least once a week, there's a game that I would watch, but it's on Pac-12 Network. I can't watch it. So Did I you even it. watch the game? No. 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 <laughs> One of the big misconceptions about covering college basketball is that you have to watch the games. Not that important. It's not really that important. And so I reached out to the uh, Pac-12 uh, office, and I said, hey, listen, there's a lot of media members that would probably like to watch your games and you know see how good Oregon State is or isn't. Um, but like we don't have access to your channel because you don't have a direct TV contract. Have you guys ever thought just throwing it out there? Because just throwing it out there, have you guys ever thought about providing logins to your streaming for for people in the media so that we can actually see these games? And they were like, "Yeah, we're not going to do that." I was like, "Well, that seems counterproductive." But uh, good luck growing your brand, exactly. Conference of Champions. That's probably a Larry Scott thing. Uh, this is a tough one. I, I, I don't know. I, this one feels toss up ish to me. I think Villanova is a slightly better team. Excited to see your little homie from Memphis. He is Kennedy Chandler. Who's he's been great. Team. He's been great. He's been, he's been terrific. Uh, but him matched up, uh, with either Gillespie or perhaps Justin Moore. We'll see how Villanova chooses to defend him. I think uh, I think this can be a wonderful game. I think this can be the very best game of the entire weekend in college basketball. I cannot wait to see it. Um, give me Nova to win. Nova to win and Nova to cover here. And I hope it lives up to the potential of being, you know, a very, very good game. Not as good maybe as Nova UCLA last weekend, but um, given the Wildcats also lost that, they've got a, a, just a, a bit of urgency here. I'll take Jay Wright's team to win. Kenny Chandler is my little homie from Memphis. He's averaging... Team high, 18 points, five assists, 1.5 steals in 24 minutes per game. 18 points in 24 minutes per game. He's six of seven from three through two games. That's 85.7%. He's 100% from the free throw line. And you're picking against that guy? Yeah, I am. He's going to come out and put RIP Dolph on his sneakers and go for 25. Uh, 
I didn't I didn't take that into consideration actually. You don't yeah, pick awesome. you don't you don't pick against a young man from Memphis in the aftermath of Dolph's young Dolph's murder. That's a fair point. Although Jay Wright just got into the Hall of Fame, this is the Hall of Fame tip off. I figure he might have, you know, the ghost of James Naismith. It'll basically be, uh, you know, the ghost of James Naismith backing Jay Wright here, while Kennedy Chandler will have understandable motivation after just a horrendous tragedy in your home city with Young Dolph, talented rapper. There, just an awful, awful, awful the, story. I almost, I don't, I don't want to overstate it. I didn't almost witness it, but like I landed right after it happened at Memphis International. And I drive right past there to go to my radio studio or uh, I drive near there to go to my radio studio. But if I decide, Hey, I might want to grab something to eat before I go to studio, I might drive right past there. And um, yeah, broad daylight. I mean, it's clearly he got ambushed. It was a targeted hit. And um, when I was leaving the airport, they had already, they were just now blocking off airways, which is the street that is, you know, runs parallel to the airport. Because, yeah, the murder happened, uh, you know, a mile and a half from Memphis International. And obviously the city's just reeling because, you know, it, it, first off, a prominent. And I know he's, you know, I, I get it. He's a flaw. You know, he, he, he lived a certain lifestyle, but he also did a lot of really good, positive things for his community. And um, to see that happen is just uh, wild. And as of this moment, they still don't have uh, suspects. So we'll, we'll see. But uh yeah, it's been a wild week here. You taking Tennessee? Of course. Ken, I'm not going against Kennedy Chandler. That's crazy. By the way, I was looking at Villanova's team stats. They have four players averaging at least 16 points per game. That's that's not common. Uh, well, we're three games in. Like, let's let's give it a few more. I know what you're saying. It's not common, but they've also uh, the UCLA game <laughs> was overtime, more minutes, and all that. They played, I think, six dudes in that game. So that's why that's happened. Yeah, I don't need your explanation. I was just stating a fact. They have four players averaging at least 16 points per game. F game four, Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern. Number 18, North Carolina versus number six, Purdue, inside Staples Center. Kim Palm has it, Purdue, minus nine. You can watch that one on ESPN News. Did you know I'm going to be at this game? Yep. Yep. I didn't assume you were going to leave after Villanova, Tennessee. <laughs> if I did that one, if I showed up, I didn't ask, you know what, I'm out. Uh, what I what did I tell you in the preseason? What did I harp on? I don't I don't listen when you talk. Okay. <laughs> Somebody actually did take a screen grab, and they were like, "I always assume Parrish clocked out when Norlander was talking." Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's like, and I'm like this. I'm like, just hurry up so I can get back to rambling again, exactly. talking about young Dolph and premarital sex. There we go. That's three shows in a row. Um, I told you Zach Eady was going to be awesome. Told you. You he, didn't say he's going to put Travion Williams on the bench. That I did not say. What is that about? It's about Zach Eady averaging 18.7 points, 10.3 rebounds, and two swats a game. Travion's doing all right for himself. He's averaging 11.7 points and 9.3 rebounds and three assists. Like, Williams has been the first guy off the bench uh, and still in 18 minutes a game. Produce friggin' terrific. They have been the reliable Big Ten team to this point, and I do think that will continue this week. If you have not yet seen Zach Eady because you just didn't really follow Purdue a ton because they weren't like a top seed last season and they got knocked out right away in the tournament, he is probably going to be the most improved player in college basketball this season, and he's a monster. He's 7'4", and he just changes the entire dynamic for what Purdue can be. Purdue is 3-0 and and has – defeated three average teams right state you know might be the best team in the horizon whatever they killed them 96 52 they also have wins over indiana state and bellerman there um as for carolina uh also three and oh but it is flirted as we talked about this with gp on the previous podcast because he was there for the charleston game but uh, flirted with brown and flirted with charleston in terms of taking a loss there one scored 94 in both of those games uh, beat Brown by seven in Charleston. They got away late. Um, so they are 3-0, and oh, but I do like Purdue in this spot. I like them to win. That line's big. I think, I think, I think too big. So if it's, I don't think it's, this is one of the deals where we got to give you the Ken Palm line because we don't have the actual Caesars line yet. I don't think it's going to be nine. 
I think it'll be like six and a half, seven. If it was that, it'd be a little bit tougher. I will take Purdue to win, but I will take Carolina to be inside the nine. I'll lay the points. Um, you know, North Carolina is 52nd at Kempom, 50th at Torvik, and 107th in adjusted defensive efficiency, according to Kempom. They let Brown score 87, Charleston score 83. Meantime, Purdue is second in the country in adjusted offensive efficiency, according to Kim Bomb. They've scored the 90s in all three games. They might put 100 on North Carolina. It's it's possible. Yeah. They might put 100 on North Carolina. And so I'll take Purdue to cover that number. Uh, I want to circle back to the Trevion Williams thing. He was sixth on our list of top 101 players in college basketball. A consensus preseason All-American. And he is coming off the bench averaging 18.3 minutes per game. He's now fifth on the team in scoring. He was sixth on our list of top 101 players in the country. He's now fifth on his own team in scoring. And Matt Painter was asked about this recently um, and and, and delivered a pretty lengthy quote. I guess he was asked about something along the lines of how does Travion feel about coming off the bench? And here's what Matt said. He said, uh, I don't think he agrees with it, but he does buy into it. And I don't want them to agree with me. I want them to be professional about it. I want them to understand the big picture about it and then go out knowing it's not personal. Their job when they came to Purdue wasn't to start. Their job when they came to Purdue was to help us win. I think it's hard to go through that, especially when you've started before. But if they've been around me, they know nothing's final, nothing's concrete. I'm not going to do it to appease somebody. I'm going to do what I think is best for Purdue. It does say a lot about Trevion, how he's handled it. You can see if they handle it maturely by how they play. They showed their maturity when they play well. If you come off the bench and you're really upset about it, you normally don't play well. You've got to have a clear mind. And then he went on to add that Zach and Trevion, quote, timeshare anyway, look at their stats. And it is true. Like Zach Eady is averaging 19 minutes per game. Trevion Williams is averaging 18.3 minutes per game, pretty close. But Eady is up 4.3 minutes per game from last season, and Williams is down 6.7 minutes per game from last season. So um, that's an interesting little thing, development that has happened in this season that a player as productive and prominent as Trevion Williams is coming off his bench and and only playing 18 minutes per game, but it's hard to argue with the results. And, you know, who who would I be to argue with? Matt Painter and that staff know their team better than I know their team and you know their team. Um, I'm going to trust that they know what they're doing, but this is not something... Um, I don't think was on many people's radar in the offseason or in the preseason that Trevion Williams' role would be coming off the bench and playing less than 20 minutes per game. Uh, did you know, because I, I somehow missed this last month, and I, I stumbled into it last night when I was getting all of this stuff ready. You know, he had an incident with a McDonald's employee last month? I did not know that, no. Yeah, so some really uh, nice reporting done on this. Um I believe by the campus newspaper, if it's not, forgive me. Um, But apparently he was at a McDonald's um, after 1 a.m. and had made a mobile order for some fries. And they were like, hey, we're closed. We're not going to be able to fulfill that order. And he's getting into it with one employee. And then that employee goes and gets the manager. The manager is like a woman in her 30s. And she comes out and she's it's it's there's audio recording of it. Like you can hear them talking and she's explaining to him, like we're we're closed just, and he's like, I've already been charged. And she's like, you're not going to be charged. Cancel your order. If you know, it'll give you peace of mind, but you know, you're not going to be charged for your fries. And he's like, I want my basket of fries. And then what you hear is um, clearly her walking away. And then you hear her scream. And she alleges that he pushed her down. There's video, surveillance video that that this publication also obtained is really well reported that shows her falling undeniably as she's re-entering the store. But it's unclear. You cannot tell. I couldn't tell by watching the video if he shoved her or if the door made her fall or if she just fell on her own. I, I couldn't tell. And, and the way the report described it was similarly. They couldn't tell. Um, so it might just be a he said, she said thing. Purdue obviously didn't punish him in any sort of public way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have no idea if any of this stuff is tied together, um, but it, it it was a pretty under the radar and no charges were filed, nothing like that. Um, but yeah, he had a 
at the at the very least an uncomfortable, awkward, possibly inappropriate um, uh, incident with a McDonald's employee last month that I think mostly stayed off the national radar. Although I'm certain every Purdue fan, uh, especially the ones on the message boards, uh, know exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, no, I had not uh, heard that, but. Um... Williams also was asked about his role a couple, uh, maybe after the first game, maybe after the second game. And um, he gave a good response to it about approaching that, all that. But I know I had not heard uh, heard that, but hopefully everything is is okay in regard to that. Last game, cruising over an hour here. Let's wrap this puppy up. Um, I'm just going to call this. I can't call every neutral court. Staples Center. If you want to do that, that's that's fine. I, I do, do want to do that. Is it still the Staples Center as we speak, or did that like did that? Are they changing the signage right now? Like, it, it, I believe it changes next month. But for okay. now, in this moment, it's Staples Center, as is Mohegan Sun. Okay. Friday. Hmm. Undefeated matchup here. Three and zero Wichita State against three and zero Arizona in Las Vegas at the T-Mobile Arena, 10 p.m. ESPNU. The line is Arizona minus nine. Tommy Lloyd's first high-profile game as head coach of the Wildcats. Who you got? Oh, I'll lay the points. Somebody tweeted me this morning and said, when's the last time somebody won a national championship in their first year as a head coach? Because Tommy Lloyd's about to do it. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It wasn't quite that. But like they were really excited about the start of the Tommy Lloyd era. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll lay the points with Arizona. Um, but that is a, that's an obviously big number against the reigning American athletic conference champions. I'm going to, did you see the, the video? I think it was Taylor Eldridge, local reporter out of Wichita. He shared. Of okay. So this would have been after the Tarleton state win earlier this week, uh, Wichita state wins because it's three and oh, Dexter Dennis, uh, fantastic player. Him and Tyson Etienne are Wichita state's two best players. And I just never seen this before. I don't know. I don't know if there's a backstory to this or if he just felt obligated to do. I don't know. But judging off the video that Taylor shared, um, it's like 45 minutes after the game has ended. Press stuff is all done. And Dexter Dennis is walking around the stands with the cleaning crew, like picking up trash in the arena. Like he's a star on the basketball. So I, I don't know if I, I don't know the backstory. I don't know if he if he wanted to do it, if he, if it's something else where he was obligated to do it. I don't know. All I know is I'd never seen anything like that. And if this is something that he just felt like he wanted to give back. Good on you, Dexter Dennis. Um, but I'd seen that earlier in the week and uh, I just can't ever. Rec- I, I've seen plenty of videos of players getting up shots an hour after the media has done what it needs to do and, and whatever. I'd never seen any player actually go you know, bag in hand, picking up, you know, used cups and et cetera, all of that in the aisles. Um, so that was, uh, that was interesting. And hopefully he was doing it for all the right reasons, which it seemed it was, I will take Wichita state with that in mind. I will take Wichita state. It's nine's a lot. Give me, give me the shockers to finish inside that number. He might've just broken curfew, you know, it could be something like that, but I don't want to assume. Yeah, that I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I don't want to assume that. Let's, let's, I, I, have you ever seen that? I've never seen that. No, no. I can't even get my kids to pick up their high C's. <laughs> 